Okay, I think, well, let's kick off. Hi, I'm Richard Jeffries. Um, I'm delighted to introduce the winner of the Gordon Warwick Award. Um, this award's made for excellence in geomorphological research for someone within 15 years of being awarded their doctorate. Uh, and this year the award goes to Dr. Joe Wheaton for excellence in research on eco-geomorphology, fluvial science and river management. And I have to say, boy, Joe has been doing some excellent work over the past decade and a half. He was awarded his doctorate in 2008 from the University of Southampton for a thesis entitled Uncertainty from Morphological Sediment Budgeting in Rivers. And as interesting as that is, it really doesn't do him justice. I met him at Southampton while we were both doing our doctorates and I quickly learned that I was in the presence of someone with immense interest and knowledge and enthusiasm for geomorphology and all things riverine. And even before starting his PhD, he had a track record of publishing and had been busy applying geomorphology to river engineering and restoration projects. And his trademarks seem to be to create the highest quality research whilst simultaneously building really accessible tools to apply that research to practical issues, particularly involving improving uh, river function and health. And he does all of this with a healthy dose of having fun on the way, whether that's kayaking down rivers or mountain biking the surrounding hills. And since his PhD, much of his research has focused on tackling ecosystem and watershed management challenges. Uh, he's now an associate professor uh, at Utah State University, uh, where he leads a vibrant research group, the et al. lab. And he's also built a restoration program at the university, developed a manual on low-tech low process-based restoration and built a consortium of researchers and software developers that build tools to better understand, simulate and manage riverscapes. That's a riverscapes consortium. And some of his most recent work has involved metrics to assess how confinement affects fluvial behaviour and how to restore river processes without using carbon intensive machines and diesel but instead making use of our natural bi biological allies particularly beavers and in simple human muscle power he has track rec an excellent track record in publishing and presenting his research to diverse audiences too so well done and over to you joe thank Hello, my name is Joe Wheaton, and I'm coming to you virtually uh, this year for the BSG's 2020 Warwick Lecture. Um, I am an associate professor of riverscapes at Utah State University and a fluvial geomorphologist as well as avid restoration practitioner. Uh, I am very privileged to be speaking with you today and humbled by um, receiving this, this award. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the, the screen here. This was just for my old British colleagues and friends to confirm that, yeah, he's graying and uh, really qualifies for the mid-career uh, part, let's say, of this, uh, of this uh, distinction. So I want to talk to you today about um, something near and dear to my heart, which is Riverscape Health. And I'm going to spend a little time um, talking about the science, standards, actions, and the community uh, that we need to build uh, to support this. This purpose of my lecture is a call to action so we can collectively contribute to addressing and reversing the urgent threats to the scapes that we care about and the ecosystems that depend on them. So I'll apologize once for um, my focus as a fluvial morphologist on riverscapes in this talk. Um, I hope what I have to say um, also has some relevance uh, to all of the, the types of scapes and ecosystems that the rest of you uh, care about. Um, I'm curious why our science isn't advancing quicker and I have some speculation and some suggestions. I think a lot of it's going to get to a core, um, somewhat boring part of my talk, which is just our lack of cohesion around adopting some standards and maybe focusing too much on the illusion of invention and not enough on the practice of innovation. Um, and then I'm going to spend some time talking about something that um, I've spent a lot of my career trying to better inform, and that is restoration practice and the management of riverscapes um, and how we can think of those as ex experiments that matter and can help management actually move the needle on riverscape health. And finally, I'm just going to close with some of the 
uh, importance of the communities that we're all part of and breaking outside our traditional silos, because it's going to take um, it's going to take a lot of us to to tackle these problems. So that same sort of narrative is really going to be uh, what will be the organization of my talk. And when I say riverscapes, this is just a convenient shorthand so that I don't have to say rivers or streams, rivers and or streams, and their floodplains, um, etc. This is a term that was popularized in the early 2000s by Kirk Fausch um, and has subsequently been used by many as, as a way of describing uh, not just rivers and streams as channels, but their channels and their floodplains throughout their entire drainage network. So we know, of course, that those rivers and streams are critically important to freshwater ecosystems. So the sort of blue lines on the map, but again, I want to get away from just this channel-centric view. And um, we're going to use this definition of riverscapes um, as the part of the landscape that could plausibly flood by their rivers and streams in the contemporary natural flow regime. And so this is important because this isn't like a legal definition of a floodplain, for example, based off some arbitrary, you know, 100 year recurrence interval flow. Uh, that is a reflection of current conditions. Instead, this definition is a reflection of what could, if this thing was in full health, what could that be? Um, so a little bit broader uh, definition of space. Um, and so these riverscapes, uh, what's kind of interesting is we actually have no idea how many of them there are in the world. This seems like a pretty basic science uh, knowledge gap that we could plug. Uh, this recent article, 2018, uh, highlights some work by Alan Pavisky. It says, Earth has many more rivers and streams than we thought. Well, this was a satellite study, and all they grabbed were the 30-meter wide water bodies that connected, you know, at least 30 meters wide, the rivers. And those probably represent something like less than 5 to 10 percent of the whole perennial network. Um, and so they found 2.1 million kilometers, which was a lot more than we thought. Well, we know that's an egregious underestimate because in the U.S. alone, we have 12 million kilometers mapped, um, of which 5.6 million kilometers are, are, are perennial. So, you know, we just we don't we don't know. There are a lot. But what we do know is that these are the most impacted ecosystems worldwide. Uh, this is a quote from a proposal um, to actually look at global river health by Barbara Belletti and Hervé Pigue. And uh, the, the, the threats are very difficult to overstate. Um, this is uh, some, some work from back in 2010 trying to look at the global threat to uh, both biodiversity and human water security. And no matter how you look at that, it is uh, it is a sobering uh, look at the health of our riverscapes. The problem we can sum up pretty quickly: there is massive, massive degradation. And if you start thinking about the the millions and millions of kilometers uh, that uh, that dissect the Earth's surface here. Uh, you can come to, for example, in the U.S., we're spending, you know, multiple billions of year trying to improve the damage that we've done to these. And whatever currency we're throwing at it, we're throwing it at a way too small of a footprint of the, the total um, kilometers of stream that are messed up. So um, this is, is a bit daunting and overwhelming. Uh, but one of the things that science has done uh, in recent years years is helped give us a better sort of analog and or reference condition for what so many of these riverscapes probably once looked like. And even in the United States, where we have a much shorter uh, history of uh, abusing and threatening uh, these landscapes than we do, for example, uh, throughout Europe, um, our baseline is so shifted that we haven't had a good view of what is possible. Um, in popular texts, this is uh, being emphasized, for example, in Ben Goldfarb's Eager, talking about the role that beaver played in shaping North American continent and uh, indeed Eurasia. But what we 
do see is an increasing recognition of the scientific literature and sort of articulation of where these sorts of streams fit in, and that's not as an anomalies. Um, these anastomosing, multi-threaded, structurally four systems, these were pervasive. And so our science is actually uh, potentially well positioned to uh, really help tackle this crisis of riverscape health. Uh, I think that some of our science has maybe lost its focus or confused impact. Um, when we are of such frequent bean counting exercises, um, where, you know, this, this whole mantra of more is better, you know, and your how many papers and how impactful and blah, 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 this whole publish or perish, um, mentality is really a recipe for, I think, repetition and reinvention. Um, and so, you know, we can instead uh, focus in on what is it out of our science that we need to emphasize to help not just uh, recognize the scope of impact, but to give some uh, hope in terms of how we could reverse that. Um, and I think that you know, I'm going to just go back to my early career as a postgraduate in the UK, actually uh, studying at Southampton and focusing on, actually as a side project on geomorphic change detection, I was working a bit with James Brasington on this. And what we kept seeing was actually, you know, early on in the literature, some pretty reasonable methods for this simple change detection problem of repeat surveys and just differentiating uh, noise from the change that you care about, i.e. geomorphic change. It was sort of spelt out. And what we were seeing is just constant reinvention. Every single paper, someone recoded this up, rethought how to do it, you know, instead of using each other's past contributions and building off of that or using a common tool. And so that's where the sort of impetus for the GCD originally grew out of. And, um, you know, a little while back, I've, you know, I've, I, I would rant on the sort of change detection problems. It's just, you know, we're focusing too much on these methodological tangents that have been solved. You know, it's like, I could, and I did spend a bunch of my career obsessing with uncertainty and how to quantify it. But, um, you know, most applications, most questions, especially if they're of a geomorphic nature, they don't need the most sophisticated change detection methods. They just need defensible ones that allow us to see a clear signal beyond the noise. And, you know, one of my motivations for investing so much time and effort in um, in developing the GCD software, for example, which uh, which certain colleagues uh, certainly thought I was crazy to do, is what are the geomorphic questions I really care about? Uh, do I need to be lost in the methodological weeds of, you know, how to do that? Or can I just, you know, do something that's going to fit the bill and then be able to focus on these, you know, and this obsession with increasingly high resolution topography, I think, yes, it, it creates pretty pictures, but those pictures are just as complicated as the real world. And at some point you're just procrastinating the sampling and analysis question. And so I would just, um, like to emphasize that we should um, be focusing on the real, you know, questions that are either our core curiosities or our core drivers in terms of some application, like, for example, improving riverscape health. We have a lot of good technical excuses for why, as a community, we are where we are at. Um, but I think they are lousy reasons to keep reinventing. Um, and some of us, um, enough of us, we could step up and say, this is, um, it is time to, to, to stop just doing the same old thing. You know, these are the excuses I hear and see over and over. Well, that algorithm is in a different software package or a different language than what I write mine in or I use. So, you know, I did my own. Well, I tried to get that tool to work, but I couldn't get it to. Uh, it's open source, but yeah, I mean, even though I, I've got the whole code, it just doesn't work. Or I don't pay for software, I can't afford it. Um, and this attitude too, that, you know, a, a lack of trust. 
you know, if we believe in the peer reviewed process, if we believe in what our scientific contributions are producing, we need to be able to build off of each other's contributions. And I, I just, just think that we're stuck in this loop of reinvention. Um, I think part of that loop comes from the fact that as scientists, we're encouraged to, you know, our, our, our benchmark for publication, our benchmark for awarding a postgraduate degree is novelty, right? And we can confuse invention with innovation. And what I'm really talking about here is not inventing the next greatest, you know, tool or new algorithm. Most of the big advances we're making these days are not from discoveries and inventions within our field or discipline. They are stealing technologies, stealing ideas and concepts and tools from other disciplines and in an innovative way, applying them to our own problems and that is helping us advance. And so what uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about is the Riverscapes Consortium. And most of what we're trying to do there is is not reinvent the wheel, nor stifle that sort of in, inventive, you know, curious nature, but more innovatively produce wheels that we can ride as far as it can take us. And so this core of the talk that I'm going to talk, talk about, and I, I apologize, this is this is not exciting, but um, I I feel the need to take this opportunity to just sort of slap us across the face and say, come on, guys, we can do better. We need to adopt some standards. And there's a lot of those before us, us being, you know, these geomorphologists um, and the BSG. So there's the tech sector. And indeed, things like GitHub have been amazing at proliferating the availability of open source uh, code that you can reuse. And despite this, the vast majority of code and tools and models that we see from our disciplines on GitHub are just thrown up there as this kind of trivial badge of like, yep, yeah, it's up there with no real attempt in most cases to make it interoperable, to make it work for others, to have enough documentation up there. Um, and so we have other examples that we can draw on, like the climate change community, who despite in my country, um, the sort of you know current setbacks and depressing state of, of affairs of ignoring um, the, the, the science, I think should be touted as a great example of a community that got its act together. And it did this about 20 to 30 years ago when they were in a similar place to us, you know, the, the system, the, the, the climate system um, for our planet that they cared about, obviously, uh, in peril, and the science uh, was confused in some cases in terms of uh, sending a consistent and coherent message about this. And one of the things that they did that was fundamental is they said, okay, we're going to stop everybody reinventing the wheel. We are going to adopt standards. We are going to, this is net CDF. This is how we're going to package up our data sets. Um, instead of having, you know, 50 different models, we're going to have a family of, you know, three or four core models from which little modules and other things can branch off. And the community rallied beyond, behind those, those standards. And um, that, as a scientific body, is, is such a more cohesive and impactful group than, um, frankly, what we are and have been right now. Now, the Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System, CSDMS, is another example I think we should look at. I think maybe there. The community is a little large. Um, it's a little too broad, and you know, geomorphology is one one little piece of it. But one of the things that they did do is they learned from uh, standards in the tech sector, they learned from the climate change community, and they pulled together resources and came up with some some, some standards for how you can um, develop your models. Now, there's a cautionary tale too in here. There's 300 some odd models that are listed on the CSDMS website, most of which people are just pushing up there, kind of like they push their code onto GitHub. Um, that's really impressive. However, how many of them are CSDMS compliant? Probably, uh, you know, about 10 to 15. And that's a problem. Um, and so the 
we have this at the top of our minds. We're talking about a smaller community with the Riverscapes Consortium, Riverscape scientists that are really just motivated by this urgent threat uh, to our Riverscapes and what can we do to improve it. And we're a bunch of scientists um, and uh, that have been, you know, working hard, develop tools, and share data so that it can be relevant to these applied and management problems. Now, everything we're doing is open source, but as I was kind of alluding to a moment ago, um, you know, it doesn't mean that it's ready to to to, to go for all audiences. Um, what I have on the bottom here is uh, just some grades of tools. So ranging from a concept to a proof of concept, a research grade tool, operational grade, professional, production, and commercial. And those labels are important. We should be more careful when we communicate and we publish our work at what level things are at. Most publications are back here in this concept, proof of concept, right? You get in and you have this novel contribution. Oh, look at the potential of this. And then most of us don't follow it through um, to a reality um, that can actually help uh, practice. Um, occasionally, the ones that get the most investment, they get up to research grade. Um, that's, I think, a sad state of affairs. We need to write into our proposals. We need to, as a community, be rallying behind the models that stand the tests of time and that we can um, adopt as, as standards. Um, so those concepts, I've, I've organized them here vertically that I was just talking to you about, those grades. And we've stolen this idea from NASA, um, who has these technological readiness levels, which is basically to describe the difference between, you know, the technology and research uh, side of things versus, you know, when you're actually ready to deploy a rocket to space. Um, and so this, um, for our purposes, we're differentiating these things based off of whether they've been vetted in the peer-reviewed literature, source code is well documented. Um, of course, it has to be open source. Uh, there's good user documentation. One is for other developers. The other is for the much larger audience of potential users. Um, of course, having an easy to use interface and having analyses that are scalable. Um, this is really fundamental um, as we think about trying to set the stage, the context for just what is it that we're dealing with. And as a discipline, you know, we have been stuck, you know, studying little tiny reaches. And uh, how do we take that uh, understanding and scale that up to uh, broad regions, uh, states, nations, continents, or the world? The point I'm trying to make is too much of our science as geomorphologists never gets deployed in the real world. Um, this NASA idea of technological readiness levels, this is an adaptation of it from the European Union. And you don't have to look at every single one of these grades, but just you got these research, development, and deployment. And I've got these sort of flipped here, but research, development, and deployment. And the pitch is that we need strategic investment to lift the best tools for a riverscape conservation out of this R&D phase, out of this kind of just keep publishing on the same old thing without actually investing in professional solutions so that we can deploy those. That's innovation, okay? Um, our, our most mature example of this is the Jimmo for change detection software that I hinted at earlier. And this is, uh, just sort of put this up to point out that this is at version seven. It's been over a decade. We've spent close to a million US dollars on investment on just the software side of this thing. And um, that's for free open source software. Uh, the point is somebody pays. You know, if you think that sounds like a lot of money, well, yeah, we might have been able to arrive there quicker if we weren't, you know, basically inventing our own wheels on this stuff. Uh, but we did at some point finally break down and more efficiently spend money to get to a professional uh, product by hiring a professional software developer. And that has made all the difference in the world, getting it out of our sort of amateur um, research and development space and into something where we can have professional user interfaces that are more idiot proof, frankly, 
as well as um, leverage some of the standards that exist in the tech sector. Now I'm going to go back and just illustrate with a handful of our tools. I'm going to show you some of the dirty laundry of what, uh, what, wh wh where we're actually at with most things. So here's a tool called NAT, the Geomorphic Network Assessment Tool. And what is it? Well, it's basically a bunch of ArcPy scripts, Python uh, scripts, you know, that run in the proprietary ArcGIS. And yeah, we've got it in GitHub. And yeah, we've got some OK documentation and blah, blah, blah. This is a classic research grade tool. And what I mean by that is it has things in it, like, for example, um, it has a confinement tool inside of it which is really kind of compelling. Like, oh, cool, you could across an entire drainage network map out, you know, you've got valley bottoms and then you can, these riverscapes, and then you can map out the degree to which the channel is up against the valley bottom margin, percent confinement, sorts of things that we as researchers read. And if you're a postgrad, you think, oh, cool, I'm gonna go try that. And then you download it and it doesn't work. Um, why? Well, because it was written, you know, for data from a particular source in the U.S. and it's fragile Esri, you know, ArcPy stuff and it's got all sorts of dependencies and it's not that it couldn't work. It's just that it's hard to get it to work. And that's where usually things stop, right? And so someone reads this and goes, oh, OK, that's neat. Someone tries to use the tool and they can't get it to work for their purposes. And so what do they do? They reinvent the wheel. They recode it themselves. Um, even more dangerous, right? You publish a paper um, at the proof of concept level, so not at this research grade level, but back down a notch. Um, so back down to this proof of concept and like, oh, cool, look at these you know, profile plots I can pull off or look at, oh, you can do reach typing or I can map out you know, confinement margins and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, one can, but can they do it practically, right? Um, just because, you know, we, we, we get, we I think, place too much stock in the sciences on, you know, the assertion of what's possible and what the implications could be. If we truly want to have broader impacts, we got to get out of this R&D loop back here and, and push it up the line. So one of the things that we've developed in the Riverscapes Consortium is this notions of uh, grading tools as well as whether or not the Riverscapes compliant. And for a tool to be Riverscape compliant, it has to have operational grade or higher. Code has to produce something that are called Riverscape projects, I'll talk about uh, shortly. And it's had to have been vetted by um, the science committee. And so we have tools that are pending Riverscape compliance, and these are ones with a grade of research um, or higher. And the developer has signaled the intent that they want to move to operational grade. Maybe they're trying to seek funding, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, confession, uh, just I, I, I criticized um, CSDMS not for having the standards, but one of the sort of things to be aware of is the level of entry to get people in to be compliant was was high. And most of the tools that we have right now are pending Riverscape compliance. They're not actually compliant. Um, here's an example of an operational grade tool. And you know, one of the things that we, we say they have to have, they have to have good documentation, how to use it. Um, we have this science committee that, uh, or this technical committee that grades those tools. And so this one's got an operational grade, but then it's got a target status of commercial grade. And in the details of this report card that you can't um, you can't read, you, you we we more transparently signal and sort of score, you know, where that tool is at. And this is so important because anytime you put a tool out there, expectation management is everything, especially today with you know all these you know fancy apps that we all download on our phone. You know, most of us, it doesn't take much to download a tool or download an app, but, you know, we try it once and if it doesn't work exactly like we were expecting it to, we never come back. We uninstall it or we never open it again. And um, we've got to remember that. Now, I want to talk about um, how with this BRAT example, which is this beaver restoration assessment tool, um, a sign of things working or success, in my view, is actually when we go backwards. So here's an operational grade tool that's open source, it's Riverscape compliant, right? So Hugh Graham uh, 
a researcher at uh, Exeter, um, working under Richard Brazier, reaches out and says, "Hey, you know, we're really interested in this tool that you have that models what you know where beavers could build dams. You know, it's built for North American beaver. Blah blah." blah. Um, I'm going to try and adapt it uh, to work in the UK. And so he grabs that open source um, tool, he, he forks it, he uh, then creates his own tool, which he's recently published here, that is a research grade tool. And I like this. If we see a lot of these sorts of things where um, researchers don't have to reinvent the entire wheel, he did make a new model, this beaver foraging index, and rolled it into his stuff. That's progress where we can. Um, we can continue off of each other's uh, work as opposed to having to completely start from scratch. Now, if we're to go where the aspirations that were in that report card are on up to commercial grade, well, right now we've actually, um, we've got a beta version of a production grade um, BRAT tool, which is basically a fancy way of saying, you know, a tool that I would run with desktop GIS, you know, one watershed at a time, I can now run for massive um, areas, for example, you know, a whole state or the, the lower 48. Uh, and so going to commercial grade really means that we take it out of a tool that's um, only something that experts could run, you know, like in a GIS, uh, for example, and, and we turn it into something that anybody can engage with. So for example, uh, end users could be practitioners that aren't highly trained, you know, GIS specialists, or they could be decision makers or landowners or the general public. And so in a lot of cases, not all, this means getting it into an easy to use web interface or uh, progressive web app. Another example of a currently research grade tool where, um, and this tool's a value bottom extraction tool, it's uh, based off of uh, Hervé Piguet's fluvial corridor tool, um, the maps where your riverscapes are, where the valley bottom is. And so right now the BLM is investing in turning this into a commercial grade tool that becomes the sort of uh, basic uh, entry point into the planning process for managing riverscapes where you can zoom into this and you see based off of freely available national data some different ways some different probabilities of of you know valley bottom mappings you choose what you like and then you could even tweak it or customize it locally so that's um, important that we partner up with with agencies that can help realize this investment, this innovation out of the research and development and into deployment. Now the magic sauce and admittedly quite boring part of, of, of a lot of this um, in terms of these standards is we package everything up into what we call Riverscape projects. And this fosters transparency, reproducibility, reproducibility excuse me, and sharing. So one of the most significant barriers to effective collaboration and leveraging of past work is the ability to share those analyses um, within the transparent context of the inputs and methods from which it was reproduced. I hear this all the time, just send me the data. And if you are someone who actually produces that data, you know what a loaded question that is. It's rarely that simple. You know, they're not gonna be able to look at it correctly. So one of the hallmarks of scientific rigor that I think we've lost sight of is reproducibility. And I think every single scientific publication, if it's not, you know, if you don't have something the equivalent of Riverscape Project um, published with it, in which you can shove that thing into an easy, you know, this is rave, is this uh, add-in to GIS uh, where you can just add that stuff in, symbolized uh, the outputs, and then pull back the curtain on what are the intermediates and the inputs this was made from. And it gives us a more transparent way to judge uh, what these things are doing. So underneath all of this, like how do I do that? Well, it's a bunch of, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead one side, very hideous and boring XML, right? Um, and, and really a lot of it's housekeeping and metadata. And we all can say, oh yeah, metadata is important, but you know, most of us are too lazy to do it. So what you really do here is if you have your own tool, your own analyses, you refactor your code. This tends to take you know, a couple hours to eight hours um, and you put it in so it writes out these Riverscape projects. And these pretty much tell us who did what, when, um, and how. They don't really tell us why that narrative is something that's 
belongs in publications, frankly, or in reports. But it at least um, allows for um, sharing and reproducibility of data. Um, once you meet that standard, then instead of having you know a whole bunch of DVDs you know floating around, oh, give me the data, we can actually you know finally catch up with the times. And it's you know none of us go to Blockbuster Video anymore to to you know check out a DVD or a VHS, right? We all stream it off of Netflix. Um, well, Netflix is hosted on Amazon Web Services. We're putting all of our stuff is also in Amazon Web Services. So if you will have Riverscape compliant tools that produce Riverscape projects, we can shove those up into warehouses in the cloud that are very easy to share with others and to then get a whole bunch of other sort of things that go along for the ride. Um, so anything from you know, web maps um, to being able to build apps. You know, you have secure ability to share this stuff. You can even mint DOIs for data sets. And so as a tool developer, maybe this sounds intimidating or expensive. What do you need? And a tool developer, I mean, like, you know, a postgraduate student this day that knows how to do a little bit of amateur scripting, right? Um, so what do you need to do? Do you have to go all the way to commercial grade to get this stuff? The answer is no. Most of us um, that are amateur programmers, and I put myself in that, we can do this stuff by, you know, basically just making research grade tools that follow these 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 standards, right? And spit out these uh, Riverscape projects. And when you do that, you can get um, a bunch of this stuff um, uh, right out of the gates. You know, some of the fancier stuff we do need a little bit more investment um, in order to to make those things work. But that's uh, that's what we're trying to push for is some standards. And, you know, I, I'm i not a software developer. I've partnered up with some really good software developers. And, you know, it's not like I, that this is the stuff that I'm passionate about. Um, the stuff that I'm passionate about, I'm going to start talking um, in a moment here. And that is what are the actions that we can do to improve Riverscape health, as an example, or, you know, just understanding these Riverscapes. And the problem is that unless we innovate and unless we invest and adopt some of these standards, I can't make a difference on this front, right? I can't explore the sorts of scientific questions that I'm I'm curious about at, at scales that I think are, are, are relevant. I think it's um, it's really fundamental. So I'm going to talk a little bit about attempts to uh, address that enormous, daunting, overwhelming scope of degradation of riverscapes. Process-based restoration, um, actually, uh, Dave Sear um, and others. Uh, probably some of the first to kind of coin that term coming out of really process uh, geomorphology and in the in the 90s and then uh, Beachy and uh, Sear and others published this principles of process-based restoration and it has some pretty common sense things in there target root causes of habitat and ecosystem change uh, tailor your restoration actions to your local site potential, right? The context matters. Match the scale of restoration to the scale of the problem. That's this thing that I've been sort of hinting at. Be explicit about expected outcomes. So it's hard to argue with any of these. These are all good principles to follow. Um, they, these aren't necessarily principles, though, that really innately tell us you know, or tell practitioners, you know, how are we going to go about doing some of this? And one of the hows that we've been pushing is what we refer to as low-tech process-based restoration. And so one of the hallmarks of degradation of some of these systems has been structural starvation and systematic simplification of channels and riverscapes by removing wood, um, beaver uh, and beaver dams. And so low tech is basically low cost, typically hand built structural additions that mimic um, functions and promote specific processes like beaver dam activity. Uh, so hallmarks of this approach include an explicit uh, focus on those processes and using really cost-effective, uh, therefore scalable um, uh, uh, solutions. 
So some of the more common examples of this, these are not the solutions. These are just um, the initial meals we like to think of them as. Um, so things that simulate uh, wood jams and things that simulate beaver dams, right? And um, they simulate those and they don't try and emulate them forever. They basically just try and kick off those processes and let those natural processes take over. And so um, there's lots of different flavors of these that I won't, won't, won't digress into. But what I do want to talk about is um, where distilling so much of the, you know, the, the decades of fantastic research on uh, in fluvial geomorphology, trying to distill that down to something that can be used in practice. We've come up with four um, principles that uh, try and help us articulate what constitutes a healthy riverscape, because that's really critical for both setting targets and um, and recognizing where we're at uh, relative to those targets. And then we have some other principles that I'll get into that more dictate how we tackle these things. And so I'll just move through these quickly. Um, so. Um, the first is that streams need space. Streams need their valley bottoms, right? And so, you know, that valley bottom tool and that definition we talked about earlier can help in that. The second is that structure, for example, the beaver dam in this, this photo, um, forces complexity and that builds resilience. And I'm going to just sort of unpack that. And this is this common thing we've seen in geomorphology, right? You know, you have uh, something here, structural elements, they force changes to hydraulics. Those amplify the rates of geomorphic processes, leaving behind more diverse topography and geomorphic units, which provides more complex habitat, which supports more biodiverse um, ecosystems. Okay, so you know one of the problems with PBR, with process-based restoration, if we think about the processes being the verbs. Um, we can get lost in all the details of these different processes, right? And those are important processes to think about. Um, however, just like in um, ecology, we focus often on keystone species at the top of the food chain, for example, um, or that are just good bellwethers or indicators of overall function. We in the process-based restoration have tried to focus on the key processes. So in this case, with structurally starved system, the P here is um, wood accumulation as a process, right? Wood piling up and creating wood jams, um, which means you've got to have all sorts of other um, processes, you know, wood recruitment, um, all the, the right hydraulics and geomorphology in place to, to get there. Um, same thing with beaver dam activity. So we're not focusing on the nouns of these little low-tech additions that we make as much as we are on the processes that you're designing and solving for and giving space. And so here's a classic example of a structurally starved system, right? This is a you know perfect bowling alley. And yeah, there's you know deception of, of, of healthy trees, but these are all young alders on a levee that was basically built by, you know, a D8 bulldozing down the center of this thing and shoving stuff off to the sides. Um, and so here's one of our little riverscape models. This is gut and geomorphic unit toolkit. And all it's showing is a bunch of yellow and cyan down this elevation profile through this uh, model output. And so those are rapids and runs, i.e. plain bed garbage. Um, why? Because this system is starved of wood. It's what we were just looking at. So um, one of the things you can do, you can put a lot of these structures in and they build complex, they force complexity and um, then that builds a more resilient system. And so here's an example of just the diversification of geomorphic units, a bunch of structurally forced pools, bars and riffles popping out when you shove a bunch of wood into the system, not rocket science. Um, it turns out that that makes the systems more resilient to disturbance. Um, and so the riverscape, its capacity to recover quickly um, or rather a lack of sensitivity to disturbance from things like floods, droughts, fires, etc. So I'm going to show you uh, two examples of this. One, these are a bunch of different types of low-tech treatments. And um, here what we're seeing is the resiliency of green growing uh, productive vegetation in the valley bottom. 
which is no longer sensitive to precipitation. Um, so after these these sorts of uh, projects are put in place, and so that's that's a really neat measure of resiliency. Um, a little more obvious example is um, right now a lot of the West is on fire, and so water doesn't burn, and so you put structure in. It forces complexity that builds uh, resilience. Um, how important those structures are? Well, it depends, and it depends on the hydrogeomorphic setting, and that's something you are all are good at, right? So reach typing, river styling, etc. cetera. Um, those are things that, that can help build those expectations. Another really important process is the, or the, or concept is the notion that inefficiency is a hallmark of health. And this is the LA River, as efficient as could be, uh, conveyance, conveyance, conveyance. Um, this is a, beater, a beaver infested um, mess, right? And what do beaver do? Well, here's, a, here's an example of what we call the water magic trick. And what beaver do is they put in structures that backwater up. And so here in the pre-dammed um, at the exact same flow, 5% of the valley bottom is inundated at base flow, and it's all free flowing. Yeah, makes sense. Well, you put some beaver dams in, we've got some ponded water behind them, overflow onto floodplain surfaces, even at low flow, we're flooding, and free flowing in between. So that structurally forced complexity not only inundates more of the valley bottom, um, but it's also a very nice reflection of the diversification of residence time of water moving through this system. And it turns out that diversification literally creates more aquatic habitat, which we've been able to tie to um, population level responses to endangered fish, um, salmon in this case. And so that's a huge deal. Um, there's uh, to get a population level response um, because of, of, of these, these simple principles. So we have a, a bunch of other principles that are more tied to what are the actions that you take. And these are things like, it's okay to be messy because, you know, well, beavers make a mess and that's what makes these things so, so complex and healthy. There's strength in numbers. We need a lot of these structures. So we better not spend too much time over engineering, over designing a single one, because we've got many, many uh, kilometers of riverscape that are in need. Um, and these things work well in weightable streams, which just so happen to make up most of our drainage networks. Um, use natural locally sourced building materials, um, things that you have around. We're doing lots of fuels reduction work um, uh, as a byproduct of fire suppression. And so getting that wood um, is a perfect structure that we can you know, feed as meals back into these systems. Letting the system do the work, um, like uh, geomorphic work of erosion and uh, deposition instead of grading with Tonka toys and diesel power, as well as having some humility and deferring the decision making um, to the system. Uh, for example, the rodent, an ecosystem engineer like a beaver, um, or to the flood. You know, how high do I have to set that floodplain at? Where, how far do I let that bank erode? Well, those aren't those don't have to be your decisions. You can come up with some expectation bounds on it. But ultimately, you're just mimicking those processes to get quickly promoting them and eventually them self-sustaining so that the system doesn't need us. Those are the goals. We've, we've wrapped these standards up um, into a design manual. And that design manual uh, is, is available free. We ended up publishing it on BookBaby and getting criti criticized for that by some for not going to our evil empire. Um, but what makes me feel good is that um, we've had over 22,000 reads of this, um, you know, and m the vast majority of them are from non-members on ResearchGate, i.e. not other scientists. Um, these, uh, this is really, really important that we are reaching this broader uh, community here. Um, and one of the ways that we're doing it is um, is trying to uh, just distill the, 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 the science down into, you know, what is it uh, that helps us recognize what healthy riverscapes can look like? 
and you know what can you do as practitioners to get you there and so you know decades of science covered in four pages in a top 10 list a little bit unsatisfying um uh, perhaps but uh but but fundamental and this is what i one of the other things that i mean by innovation Finally, um, we have a community that's bigger than our science. Um, that includes, uh, like my dear friend here, um, Jay Wild, a rancher. Uh, this is a publication that came out in Beef Magazine. This is not a joke. Um, where we've got ranchers and farmers who are singing the praises of some of these techniques and of beaver um, because of the benefits that they see uh, to their operations. And part of that is having a shared vision, and that vision has been resiliency um, to, to fly or flood, drought, etc. Another part of it is building a massive workforce. We've taught over 20 uh, low-tech workshops. We've reached over 1,000 participants. Um, uh, we have all of the workshop materials up online. We were forced with COVID to have to do a virtual version recently. Instead of getting people out and literally building, um, we made them sit through a boring lecture like this, but all of those modules are up. And what we had was over 767 participants from all over the world, mainly the U.S., but um, taking this and the staying power over those uh, five or four days and five modules was really pretty impressive. Um, this threat that we face is massive, and it's it's really really important that we scale up our techniques in order to tackle it properly. Um, if you need a call to restore, um, this call to action, we've got a chapter in the design manual on, on just this. And it, I just try to make the argument that we need to work smarter and more efficiently. And the key is working with an understanding of how ri healthy riverscapes function. What are their processes, right? And we, we de-emphasize the structures themselves. Um, and we, um, we really sort of empower those systems uh, to do the work and we've got a great track record of a lot of diverse organizations um, foundations uh, nonprofits agencies etc that are doing this sort of work and I think you know some of you could also be some of those amazing people doing that sort of work or inspire others to join in and some of the rest of you, I'd like to call um, on you as a Riverscape scientist to be part of the Riverscape Consortium, contribute tools, analyses, data sets, but let's adopt some standards. If you don't like ours, that's fine. Maybe you can you know, put a ton of energy into inventing something else, but until something else exists, I don't think there's an excuse um, not to rally behind um, some standards. So my takeaways, Riverscape health problem is incredibly difficult to overstate. We need this community's science to be distilled and scaled up to tackle these challenges. There's a, a number of tools out there for understanding riverscapes. I haven't really reviewed those, but there's, there are tons and so many of you are authoring them. Um, but we need to develop those um, with some standards in mind so that they can get adoption. A publication alone is not enough. Um, and collectively, um, I, I do believe that these can really help us tackle these problems. So thank you so much for your time, and I apologize for going over. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, you didn't go over. You still got a few minutes for questions. Um, that was absolutely outstanding. I love that presentation. Um, and I did say in my intro that you brought enthusiasm uh, as well as application of the science well that's brilliant um and um i'd like to just go through a couple of questions uh if i may um uh there's one that i think was uh, was sort of answered um during the the the, uh, the talk which was um we need greater idiot proofing to yield greater progress and impact do you want to just briefly sort of reprise your answer there just just so in case anybody missed it on the chat how would you yeah, answer that, that that's that's a really yeah good question and yeah sorry for my flippant uh, terminology and thanks uh, uh, Richard for your kind words but uh, I, I guess whether or not we need idiot proof um, is more a question of audience and so uh, who's the audience that you need to reach to 
move the needle you care about, you know? So is this a tool that um, we need to make much more accessible, for example, like GCD to largely a bunch of researchers? And so then I'm talking about a professional grade tool that that just um, is, it is less fragile and doesn't break? Or am I talking about something that I need to make available to managers and the broader public, et cetera? And so it's, it, it doesn't always have to be idiot proof. I mean, maybe I have a really small audience and it's just some fellow developers. And so it just needs to be well documented and adhere to a standard. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, not everything needs to be idiot proof. I'll revise my answer there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, David Sear, um, he, you, you'll see us on the chat, um, who's talking about asking practitioners what they need. Um, from your experiences, what have the practitioner community told you about what they would value to solve the problem? Yeah, you know, um, David, and I think Richard, you know this, I mean, when coming out of my master's, I really was obsessed with, I thought practitioners needed more approaches and then we did this survey way back in 2004 um and you ask them what approaches they use and you know everybody fancies making up their own approaches and you know they combine and mix and match things and so i guess what i sort of felt like um there's kind of two prongs of what's needed a more modular sort of pieces that people can put together and each of those modular pieces um, work well um, together, but also I think um, I think just help on, and this is where the geomorphology community can really come in on reimagining what's possible and on visioning and on um, and uh, just kind of painting a picture, literally sometimes of what these places could look like um, uh, and the expectation management. When we say things like, well, streams need space, and you map a valley bottom that could be pretty shocking when you have a bunch of infrastructure in it. Now that doesn't mean you can't do anything. It's not a black or white. And so we can help them with those nuances in the expectation management. And, and so I think that our, our community here has, has a huge role to play in that. Thank you, Joe. Um, a, a related question um, is one I sent you earlier. So uh, <laughs> people shape riverscapes, they shape landscapes and riverscapes are very valued and used by many people for all sorts of different purposes uh, a lot of which is steeped in at least in the uk in tradition you know people like moan green deserts in some places for example or, or or static pieces of still water uh, to go kayaking on and things sorry i know you're a kayaker by the way but a different <laughs> kind of kayaker but people are key so how can we as geomorphology community influence society so that they value riverscapes in a different way, in the way that's needed, or we see is needed, uh, perhaps to address some of the issues of degradation and particularly to manage the risks such as or issues such as climate change. Yeah, it's 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 great uh, question. I um, yeah, the the people side of the of the whole conservation and restoration business is far more important and. You know, part of it is we need to just go in listening a bit more than jumping in with uh, sometimes with the, with the solution. You know, so for example, with with ranchers um, and with farmers, you know, like taking a genuine interest in their sort of operations, their sort of struggle. Like, how is it you're trying to to make this thing think this thing work? Having some empathy with that, and and then after doing that what's the common ground what's the shared vision and that's why mm -hmm. I, I mentioned resiliency because you know you can we can talk about resiliency of you know working lands or you know farming operations uh, resiliency of a community um, to disturbances and that conversation can be incremental we don't have to for example you know move every structure immediately out of uh, out of a valley bottom um, you know, much less uh, the floodway. Um, instead, we get increasing, you know, frequency of those natural disasters and disturbances and politically those become easier conversations to have over time, especially if we've already dealt with the expectations. And so I don't know, it's, it's just it's patience, it's empathy, and it's, it's listening, and then using that with the context that you guys have as, as geomorphologists, I think, to, to try and um, try and rectify some of those conflicts. I like that. 
find the common ground and uh, and be uh, you know interested and empathetic with what other people are struggling with. I think that's very valuable. And you certainly uh, set out a lot of things for us to, as a community, to consider. And, and I'd say raise the bar. You know, you set a set an ambition for us to work towards. So, thank you very much. Um, there are uh, there's one more question I'd just like to come to. It's from uh, Joe Shannon. She says, "What tools can we use or to or develop?" to help us target resources where they'll have the biggest impact? Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, t targets, targeting where they have the biggest impact is a tough one. Um, I, think, I think if you've clearly identified your audience, um, uh, if I'm understanding the question uh, correctly and, and what the sort of needs are, then I think, I guess part of my message is, you know, there's standards and there's people out there that 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 can help. Um, so we need to be not afraid to. We don't have to do everything ourselves. We can, we can bring in, you know, people who are a better at communication than we are, b better at programming than we are, at, you know, as scientists, and and we can partner with them. And so I think it's it's a little bit bigger tent and a bigger community to tackle those things and have and and have that impact. And we just need to not be afraid to say, hey, I don't know that, that's outside my, my, my wheelhouse, but I know somebody who, who, who might be able to help. Thank you very much. Right, I'm gonna close the questions now, but I'm just gonna finish on a, on a bit of a, a, a quote from your presentation. Um, I, I think you sort of said, you know, you need to start with the humans in your last question answers, uh, answers to your questions, but you also need to let nature do the work and particularly geomorphic work and deposition, erosion and deposition instead of playing around with Tonka toys and diesel power. Beautiful. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Heather now.